Good morning, friends. Welcome to Kansas City, Kansas Public Library in our program, Gardening for the Birds and Bugs. Let's welcome our presenter today, Lynn Lowry from Kansas K-State uh, Research and Extension. Please, Lynn. Hey, uh, welcome this morning. I keep thinking it's afternoon, but we're still in the morning. So I'm going to talk about mainly plants and habitat that you need to create for encouragement of birds and insects. A lot of times people... Lynn, you're disappearing. Pardon me? You are disappearing. Oh. There wow. is a, some kind of noise and no, no voice. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so what we're going to talk about are landscapes and gardens and how they become ecosystems. And so do you guys know what an ecosystem is? Well, the definition is a biological community of interacting organisms that are living. So you've got plant materials that are living, you've got organisms, microorganisms, birds, animals, insects, all of these organisms work together in a physical environment. And that environment is got to assist the organisms in survival, providing food, shelter, all those sorts of things. So that's the importance of creating a garden or landscape that's conducive to drawing in desirables. Unfortunately, with desirables, you sometimes get the unwanted ones, but we're going to try to uh, ignore them and focus on the good, the good guys. So these are just some gardens that have a lot of native plant materials. Natives right now are the fad. Uh, natives are what you think of when you drive out through the prairie out west in western Kansas, the flowers that are blooming. Native grass prairie. We try to construct those gardens in our own landscapes because they're usually lower maintenance, require lower water requirements, and they're conducive to creating this ecosystem with our native birds and insects. And so you can see um, that if they're managed correctly, correctly, they can be quite attractive. I think we need to mute some people, maybe. Um, yes, I wanted to say, let's everybody mute ourselves so that we don't have this interfering echo. Okay, so one of the key reasons we want to encourage wildlife, whether it be insects, mammals, or whatever, is everybody is a pollinator. Believe it or not, even we are pollinators. So as we're walking out into our landscape, let's take our yard. In about two weeks, we're going to have a massive color of yellow dandelions in our yards. And so people think that's more of a weed, but it attracts a lot of early season pollinators to those yellow flowers to get nectar. And in the process, our shoes or insects pick up pollen from the dandelions and move it to a plant. So pollinators are really critical for our food supply. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the whole reason we need pollinators is to number one, provide food for us. And if you read the quote there, this came from the National Audubon Society. Uh, one out of every three bites of our food including fruits, vegetables, chocolate, believe it or not, coffee, nuts, and spices, is created because of pollinators. The only reason we have new plants, oftentimes, is the seeds that then are produced from those pollinated fruits. And therefore, plants can keep um, recreating them themselves in nature. Same thing happens in our gardens. So we need insects, we need birds, birds, Pollinators. Most of you see hummingbirds that we uh, love to watch go to our flower and get nectar, and in the process, they're pollinating flowers, moving from plant to plant, flower to flower. 
Lynn, you're still disappearing. Can you adjust your microphone, maybe? Uh, my microphone's up as high as it'll go. Mm. Well, right now it was very clear. <laughs> okay. Um, so when we also talk about insects and mites, there's different beneficials, I'll put it that way. And these are called parasitoids, predators, and again, we've talked about pollinators. Only about one-tenth of a percent of the insects are considered serious pests. An example of a serious pest would be Japanese beetles or termites, something like that. But most of our insects, like ants, like ladybird beetles, or people call them ladybugs, help to control unwanted pests like aphids. So we want to encourage insects in our gardens and landscapes. How do we do that? Well, any activity that will protect, attract, or keep the existing pollen populations at their natural level is what we want to create. And that would mean we need diverse plant materials in our landscapes, flowers, trees, shrubs, even vegetables. These plant materials bring them in to feed on nectar, to feed on seeds, or whatever. They also need help, for instance, like if you think, you know, birds are out building nests, and where do they build the nests? In trees and shrubs where they're protected, their young is protected from other predators, from humids, whatever. So we need diverse landscapes with diverse plant materials. So does this property have much of an ecosystem? I don't see very many shrubs. Matter of fact, there are none. There is a new tree in the landscape, but there are no flowers for nectar. There will be a few leaves on that tree. Maybe there will be one bird nesting in that tree. But this is the kind of landscape that's void of any plant materials and probably void of any kinds of birds, wildlife, or insects. Now, there will be some insects in the turf, but not the kind of ecosystem that we want to create. We want to attract insects, birds, and other pollinators. To do that, we need food, we need shelter, and we need liquids. So the nectar from the flowers provide those liquids for many of our desirable insects. Birds, they need plants for the seeds, nuts, berries, nectar, and insects. Birds eat a lot of our insects, more so than we ever give them credit. We do encourage feeders to supplement. And those are usually in the heat of the summer or in the winter months when there is a food source out there for the birds. So here we've got a picture of a goldfinch eating the coneflower spent seeds. A lot of times people like to what we call deadhead, remove those flower seeds and blooms, but that provides a lot of food for our furry friends. If you see on the bottom right, we've got a wren, a grasshopper, that it is actually consuming. So the Audubon Society says basically Birds will consume between 400 to 500 million tons of insects and other arthropods each year. And rarely do we think of them. So they are great to have around. Just like birds, our bugs need food as well. And they basically get that from the next Mainly the Some of the, what we call, of bugs or the larval stage, they will actually live off of plant sand or chew up the leaves to get their food. When you're trying to encourage butterflies, we all love to see butterflies. 
a lot of different flower structures encourage better um, nectar source. So flat flowers, anything that they can get their mouths for a butterfly, it's called a proboscis, into the center of the flower to retrieve the nectar. If you have deep tubular flowers, those are better for your hummingbirds that have a longer beak or mouth part. So it depends on what you grow, whether you have conducive sources for nectar. The other thing to be aware of is some of our newer cultivars of flowers may be sterile. In other words, they don't produce um, the pollen or the nectar that some of the native plants do. So you just need to have a diversity of flowers and plants so that you do have adequate food source for the birds and the insects. Now, when we're talking about caterpillar food, these are caterpillars that chew and leave holes in your plants. So you've got to really be um, tolerant of having damage to your plants. They do not eat nectar. They eat the plant parts, okay? So you've got to tolerate chewing. So chomping is allowed in your garden. This happens to be that's feeding on parsley. So there's actually preferred caterpillar foods. Plants provide food for the caterpillar. The adult butterflies, they don't care what they get. They may kill my flower as soon as they can get back. They'll flit around get numerous flower sources. But let's take the monarch. Everybody's keen on getting the monarch alive. So they're caterpillars. They can eat milkweed plants. There are several different types of milkweed. That's what they can only feed on. So if you have a landscape and no milkweed, you're not going to have monarch caterpillars. You still will have because they will feed on flowers. If we talk to the painted lady butterfly, and I'll show you pictures of these coming up, their caterpillars will feed off of daisies, hollyhocks, thistles, and a few other plants. They're not as specific as your monarch. So let's get into some of these butterflies and caterpillars. So again, this is your monarch. This is the one that gets the most. This is the one that we're trying to protect. We've seen monarch butterflies go away because farmers are doing better at controlling weeds in their crop fields. Not only do they spray the crop, they also spray the ditches, the roadside ditches that are usually full of milkweed. And therefore, there are no food sources for the caterpillars. So people are encouraged to plant milkweed in their landscapes. There's tropical milkweed that's an annual that you can buy at most garden centers and nurseries, or there's the perennial milkweed that grows in our pastures that we can bring into our landscapes. So you've got the caterpillar chewing away on the milkweed. This is the chrysalis. It's really a beautiful green with a gold band here and sometimes there's dots along here. And then of course, we all know what the adult looks like. The painted lady, we usually see these more in the fall of the year, although they're out there the year or summer. These prefer to eat caterpillar here, daisies, hollyhock, and thistles. So that's what they chew on. Your painted lady butterflies, where I see most of them is on sedums, like autumn joy sedum in the fall of the year. And these guys will be out there very prolific. Swallowtails, this is a huge group of butterflies. There's giant swallowtail, there's tiger swallowtail, zebra swallowtail, there's pipevine swallowtail, there's numerous swallowtails. 
and they have tail light projections. See these down here where my pointer is or over here, these little projections. That's how you can tell their swallowtails. Okay. And this is the black swallowtail. This is the larva. You saw a similar picture earlier. They like the parsley family plants to chew on. So that would be carrot, dill, parsley, fennel, and for a weed that they like is Queen Anne's lace. These have rather flat, what we call umble flowers. And um, the butterfly Tiger swallowtail, I never have seen a larva. They have a very large business. My plants, I don't have it. This is a but one we have recently. You will see. Lynn, we can't hear you. Okay, I don't know why it's cutting out. I'm not showing any computer issues. Anyway, the swallowtail loves the highest this early springtime. So bulbs are an excellent source of nectar, particularly this time of year when most everything else is dormant. The tiger swallowtail larva feed on cherry, birch, tulip tree, lilac, and willow. Again, they're hard to find because they blend in so well. I can't say this enough. Caterpillars must feed on plants to survive and mature. So you have to avoid using pesticides in the field or you're going to eliminate caterpillars. Down on the bottom right, these happen to be cabbage worm butterflies. And I don't consider them a good bug. They do a lot of chewing on our cabbage and cold crops. And here's an example in the middle. And here is the, the caterpillar. So again, if you're missing butterflies, then grow cabbage for them or grow enough cabbage that you can sacrifice some of the plants. Um, and then you'll have enough to eat as well. There are insecticides that control only caterpillars. And here's two examples. This is BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, and it's been used for years and years by the organic people. But again, if you're trying to encourage butterflies in the garden, do not, do not use these products because they can't best distinguish between a good and a bad caterpillar. So this is just some pictures that I've taken. Um, if you're going to have bees and insects, no chemicals. Or at least when you do spray, don't be out there when you have foraging insects. Now, just as insects need shelter, our birds do too, particularly in the winter and during nesting periods. Evergreens are an excellent plant to put in the landscape so that they have winter cover. Um, this picture down here is a Cooper's hawk, and Cooper's hawks eat other birds. And so these birds need to find shelter from these hawks. And that's why evergreens are great, because you have year-round cover for them. Also, a lot of ornamental grasses are in favor right now in the landscape. And those provide an excellent seed source and shelter for birds in the winter months as well. And of course, we don't want to forget about the nesting. Um, here's a robin, baby robins in my um, tree that you just out. And again, they're up high enough to hopefully keep the cats away, but also to shelter them from other predators. When we talk about butterflies, they also need trees and shrubs for windbreak. They are cold-blooded, so like today, 40 degrees, yesterday it was, what, 80? So that you won't see a lot of butterflies out flooding around until they lay out in the sun 
things. So they need trees and shrubs to them down in until they can get warm enough to move about. And they also need shade in the sun to regulate their body. So you need shelter not only for birds, but for the butterflies and insects. Birds in particular need water. Again, insects usually get their water from the nectar in the plants or the juices in the plants. But birds, we need to provide um, water, mainly in the plenty of ponds and stuff that, that they can get water from in the summer months. If you are trying to encourage butterflies, mainly in the heat of the summer, and a lot of our water pools are kind of evaporated, you can actually create what they call butterfly pie, which is water plus mud and our soil minerals. And you just make kind of a mud slurry uh, and place it in a dish or ground. Or you can actually put overripe fruit into dishes and that will be in the ants as well. So you just have to be tolerant. Bees, bees are excellent pollinators. As a matter of fact, fruit growers brought over the honeybee from Europe because they are very efficient. They are in hives. There are thousands of bees in the hive, and they are very efficient pollinators. And most of our fruit crops require pollination to create that crop like wheat. But the thing you have to remember is these bees are very, very sensitive to chemicals. So insecticides can be deadly to these guys. So again, no chemicals if you're trying to encourage bees and other insects. Here's an example of the most common insecticide used by homeowners, and that is seven insecticide. If you read the label, which you should be reading the label before we use any pesticide, there is a bee caution statement on the label that says this product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment. So it tells you right up front, do not use this or you will kill bees. Yes, it's very effective in killing other insects as well. Beneficial insects, these are usually the little bitty guys that we rarely see or pay attention to. And they can include ground beetle, the black beetle that runs along the ground. Um, if, for instance, you have aphids, which is a bad bug, on your plants, you can use a hard spray of water to knock those plants off of the plant, and then the ground beetles on the ground go and devour them. So that's kind of how some of the beetles work. Of course, we know that the ladybug or the ladybird beetle, they thrive on eating aphids. So does the green lacewing, and I've got some pictures to show you of some of these things, but I'll let you look at the list here. So a lot of the bugs that we really don't know can be very helpful in eating other bad bugs, and they're also pollinators. So here we have the ladybug larva in this picture. I get lots of calls people telling me they have orange and black alligators on their plants and they want to kill them. But this is the larva stage of the ladybug. And it loves aphids. It will devour more aphids than the adults. Other examples would be wasps. Wasps are very good predators. For those of you who grow tomatoes, you may have seen tomato hornworms on your tomato plants. And sometimes you'll see them covered in little white sacks. The wasp actually will lay eggs on the caterpillar. And as those eggs hatch, they eat the caterpillar. 
So that's how some of these predators work. The other cool thing about insects and plants, there's kind of a synergy there. When a plant is being attacked, is devouring plant and tree, that tree will actually send out chemicals to try to lure in other insects that might feed on the Japanese beetle. And to be quite honest, I don't know if such a thing exists. But in the case of the ladybug beetle, there would be chemicals to draw them in. The ladybird beetle would lay eggs, the eggs would hatch, and then those alligator larvae, looking larvae, would devour those aphids. Also, the insects can also give out chemicals to tell other predators, hey, I've already been here, get away. Let me eat till my heart's content. So there's a synergism between plants and insects. These are assassin bugs, and these are very, very good at control. And they also have a bite that hurts them. If you've ever been stung or bitten by an assassin bug, it will hurt, it will burn. But they have a very long beak that they use to pierce their prey. So these guys are very, very effective at controlling caterpillars. But again, if you're trying to have a whole crop of monarchs, they don't know a good caterpillar from a bad caterpillar. But that's another nature, that's the cycle of life. Green lace wings, you can see the adult here. Uh, you can see why they're given their name. There's also a brown lace wing. This is the larva stage. This is the one that eats the most insects. This is the egg. The egg is on a long filament on the plant, and that is to keep them from eating each other. So again, Mother Nature does some really unique things. Here we're back to our monarch caterpillar. Here we've got green lacewing or brown lacewing eggs. And here we have the aphids. These guys are just waiting to hatch. As soon as they hatch, they will have lots of aphids to eat. Ground beetles, I kind of talked about that before, but there's different types. This is the larva. The larva lives underground and they're all consuming a lot of Most of these you don't see because they feed at night. And then hover or surfed flies. These are great beneficial insects. A lot of people confuse them for bees because they look a lot like bees. Um, and they hover over the plants. So sometimes you will notice them. And again, people presume that they are bees. They are actually a fly. And here's our ladybugs. Here's those little allig alligators again. Now they go through a, a pupa stage right here that we get lots of calls on. People say, what is this weird bug on my plants? And again, it's just a life stage of the ladybug or ladybird beetle. And these are M, uh, aphids that the ladybird bug is devouring. Praying mantid. Praying mantids are actually very opportunistic. They don't move around as much as the prey comes to them, and they will eat each other. This time of year, when you're cleaning up your garden, you may see these facts here. This is full of thousands and thousands of eggs, and they'll hatch probably in another couple of weeks, but we get a lot of people thinking there, there's something wrong with the plant because it's being grossed on them. And these are actually the mantid egg sacs. Spiders, again, we want to kill spiders when they're in our homes, but I encourage you to take a piece of paper and just pick it up and take it outside. Uh, spiders eat a lot of bugs. Um, some have webs and some do not. 
uh, the wolf spider here on the left lip beads and then of course the garden orb spider is beautiful and uh, it catches a lot of prey in it. Um, web. There are other tiny, tiny insects. Again, a lot of these are the wasp, and you can see there's several pictures. Um, they sometimes will lay eggs through this ovipositor directly into an insect. This happens to be So again, a lot of these very minute insects are very beneficial. And let's just skip this and uh, show you the picture of what I was talking about with the tomato hornworm. These little white um, egg sacs, they'll hatch and then they eat the caterpillar. And it's these little guys that are doing that. You don't even see them, they're so tiny. Now, the big fad about 10 years ago was for everybody to buy insect houses, or buy or build insect houses. To be honest, I see a lot of spiders in these. I also have seen mason bees in these. But other than that, I like to just leave a lot of my flower spray through the winter months. Or sometimes they'll get into the hollow stems of my perennials. So I try to wait to clean up my gardens and temperatures were in the 50s. By then, most of the time, those eggs in the stalks of the perennials will have hatched and moved out. So there's all kinds of plants that encourage different insects. And so I'm going to leave this up a minute if you want to take a photo of this. Um, so as you're thinking about creating ecosystems, you want to include some of these plants in your landscape bring in these different beneficial insects. Okay, so garden design. So if we want to create an ecosystem, here are some key things to consider. You want to plant different plants that bloom throughout the growing season. In other words, bulbs our early spring. We don't have a lot of butterflies out this early or insects. They are there. They're very hungry. They have come to life and they need nectar. And so bulbs would be great for spring. Then you get into your summer plants and fall asters and your autumn joy sedum are great plants. So you want to think about different plants that bloom at different times of the year. And you want to have a constant bloom cycle so that there's always nectar available for the adults. We usually say group your plants three to five so that you have a good source of seeds and nectar and you get a lot of color splash. Most insects need sunlight, particularly your butterflies, cold-blooded, so they need the heat of that sun, sun to get themselves um, out and about and able to fly. Again, you need a diversity of plants. We've talked about insect caterpillars need different food sources. So if you're wanting to encourage monarchs, you definitely need to have quite a few milkweeds. If you're looking to have some of the swallowtails, if you're if you're an enthusiast for pipeline swallowtail, you need to grow a pipeline. Otherwise, the larva won't have a food source. So you have to do a little homework. Now, some I'm going to run through these really quickly uh, because there's numerous annuals, perennials, whatever. But these are just some good plants to consider that are easy to grow in Kansas City. Um, we have petunia listed here, and we do have a caterpillar called the budworm that loves to eat the blooms out of geraniums and petunias. So whether you like them or not, 
they're going to be attracted and going to eat the flower buds of those plants. And we get a lot of calls about how can I control those caterpillars? Well, the only way to do it is to use pesticides. And again, if you choose to use pesticides, you're going to kill a lot of beneficial insects. But that's a personal choice. So don't forget that chives, chives are easy to grow. You can eat chives. They are a magnet for a lot of the tiny wasps and pollinators. So adding one little bundle of chives to your garden will draw in lots and lots of butterflies. Mid-season, again, there's numerous plants, bee balm, black-eyed Susan, Coreopsis. Again, try to keep more of the native plants. Don't bring in a whole bunch of cultivars. All of these plants have been developed with cultivars, meaning improved varieties, either for improved color, a shorter than the natives, but try to keep more of the natives. They have better nectar and better pollen source. Again, here's what we're trying to create. We're trying to recreate our natural habitat for insects and birds. This has, happens to be in the Conza Prairie. You've got bee balm out here. You've got some asters. You've got some sunflowers. You've got milkweed. So again, a host of different plants. And again, here's some of your swallowtails and your monarch. And butterfly bush is a plant. They name those plants because they draw in a lot of beautiful butterflies for the nectar. Cone flowers are probably the easiest perennial to grow. They're very drought tolerant. They come in purple and white, and there's newer varieties that are orange and yellow. And if I were going to plant cone flowers, I would go with the purple coneflower, the more native one, and it will bring in a host of birds and butterflies for the seeds and the nectar. And then don't forget our daisies. Daisies are also very easy to grow. Um, I like to look at drought tolerant plants, be out watering, and with the way our utilities are going up and up, water is a precious commodity. Daylilies. My hummingbirds love my daylilies. I've got some really red ones that they visit, and they have quite a bit. And them. bees love them. Bumblebees love them. So again, look around, try to get a diversity of plants. And again, here's what nature would have out there for the birds and the, the insects. Now, some of these natives can be quite spicy. When you see them growing out in the prairie, they're usually among native grasses. And those native grasses compete with the native perennials to keep them in check. When we put those in our glorious improved soils in our gardens, we don't have those grasses to compete. And sometimes these plants will become what I call a thug. They take over. So mountain mint, there will be hundreds of insects on those plants when they're in bloom. But that plant is very, very, very aggressive and will take over. Um, you all know mints. You can't hardly keep them contained. So just keep that in mind. Nothing's perfect. And then again, the milkweeds. You can grow the tropical milkweed to draw in your butterflies. These have to have warm temperatures. So you have to wait till about midday to put them out. And then, of course, the first freeze, they will be gone. But there are lots of perennial native milkweeds that we can grow. And here we go. This is out in the Conza Prairie. 
And that's what we're all about is bringing in swallowtails and monarchs and other butterflies for the nectar. And some of the sedums and some of the penstemons and um, I've lost what I'm trying to say with this one on the bottom. Uh, but they love the nectar in those plants. Here's just some more sunflowers. Great, great for bees and birds to come in once those seeds have matured. And then shrubs. Don't forget buttonbush. Buttonbush is utilized. Here it is over here. It's got these really cool flowers. You can see the the uh, stamen sticking up above. Um, privet. Privet. So don't forget your shrubs. And then in the fall, asters, they're a magnet. Sedums, the autumn joy sedum, they're a magnet. And then we have glossy abelia, which is a shrub that blooms in the fall. And blue mist spirea, that's a great plant too to bring in pollinators. And salvia, salvias will bring in hummingbirds as well. So particularly the birds. Um, so you've got a plethora of plants to choose from. Other late season plants, you know, we've got golden has tons of beetles on it, the butterflies, you name it. And then Ironweed is a native that we find in the Conza Prairie. Unfortunately, in our gardens, that'll get seven to nine foot tall. So again, this is where breeders go out and say, you know, that's a really drought tolerant perennial, but it's really too tall for our established gardens. So let's try to create a new cultivar that's shorter, that is better maintained in our home gardens. And that's how we get these advanced cultivars. They try to take a great plant and make it even better where it's better made in our landscapes. And sometimes you'll be perfectly fine with the pollen and the nectar. Sometimes when they do breeding, they lose some of that as well. And again, this is what a fall garden would look like. So we have birds that are here year round. And that's why it's important that we leave our ornamental grasses, the seeds that are on those seed heads. That's why we plant nut trees like oaks that have acorns or hickories that have nuts. Um, so we can't forget that a lot of birds are out feeding in the winter months and, so, and I know a lot of people supplement that with feeders which is great and that's gotten quite expensive too with bird seed going up astronomically the past few years. Here's some more of our feather, feathered friends to keep in mind. Okay so with that I'm going to stop. Uh, Dr. Raymond Cloyd, the case powered by them. And so he is actually coming to Wyandotte County tomorrow at 11.30 to do a class for my master gardeners that is open to the public. And so if you wanna hear from Dr. Raymond Cloyd, he will be talking about how to get rid of harmful while acting beneficial insects. So very timely for this presentation. So do we have any questions? Yes, I let's think. unmute ourselves and ask some questions. So this is Monica. I have a question about Orioles um, and it's, it's a multi-part uh, question. 
So if you don't have Orioles in your area already, is it possible to attract them? And how would you attract them? And then I also heard that like there's a short season where Orioles would be in your area. So I'm just wondering about that. Okay, well, let me do my disclaimer. I'm a horticulturist, which means plant enthusiast. So yes, birds, I know a little bit about. I am not an anthologist. I don't study birds. Birds that frequent my backyard. My friends who have Orioles, and I have none, tell me that the main thing you can do is put out grape jelly. And if they're in the area, they will find that grape jelly, or they will slice oranges and put orange halves out in their yard. I have to tell you, I've tried that. And I have never been able to draw them into my neighborhood. So that's what I can tell you from a personal standpoint. I have lots of friends that have them. And I think they're there quite a few months out of the summer. Okay, well, I may try that this year. What would be the best time, do you think, to put the grape jelly out? Do you what know? I did is I put it out mid-June. Oh, June, not till June. Okay. That's when I put it out. Just okay. based on what my friends were telling me they were seeing them. Now, I attracted a lot of ants and a lot of bees. Uh -huh. So don't put it anywhere, like, on your deck. Right. Uh, okay. So they have shelter to come into. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? I don't have a question. I just have um, some advice for your Orioles. My best advice is really to find somebody that you know that is getting Orioles in their yard and then keep um, when they say, oh, I've seen the Orioles, then that's when you need to be putting out your jelly and oranges. So my understanding is they come out um, when they're getting ready to nest and they're doing lots of eating um, to prepare to to be nesting and, and all of that. So that's my um, advice is to just do a little bit of research and try to find somebody in your area that in Kansas City that's like, oh, I've seen an Oriole, then that's when you should put out your your fares and wares. I would have... Thank you for the question, for the comment, actually. Well, I do have a question. Uh, right now, you know, it's early spring. A lot of daffodils are blooming. And my daffodils are being eaten by something. I find dead buds on the ground, chewed up flowers. Never had this issue before. So what could be eating my daffodils? Well, now, if you were asking me about tulips, I would say deer, but deer don't like daffodils. So the next culprit might be squirrels, although they usually don't eat them, but they will destroy them if they're bored. Um, so I don't know, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I've never had that complaint in 20 years, so, but I will get, Tons of calls on tulips being devoured, and that's deer. Deer find them just like crack cocaine or <laughs> or a candy for us, you know. So daffodils I don't usually hear of much going on with it. Yeah, never had this issue before, but this time, uh, deep in the yard by big trees, I have two bunches of daffodils that are just chewed up hmm. interesting and they're bitter and nobody likes them <laughs> <laughs> well my friends who have tulips and deer it's ugly but from a distance you can build little um chicken wire boxes over the tulips and from a distance you don't see the wire but they will not be able to and to break that wire to get through those. And that works. There are deer repellents, and some work and some don't. Depends on how hungry the deer are. 
then you have to apply them after every rain or if heavy do. So I'm not sure that's worth the effort. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? The presentation was wonderful. Thank you. Well, does anybody else want to ask a question? No, then uh, we thank Lynn Lowry for this wonderful presentation.